I'm very excited to present you with our next speaker, Demelza. And we are moving into the Bitcoin topic, so she's the perfect prelude for the, the panel discussion that's coming up after her presentation. Okay, probably I don't need that. Okay, so thanks a lot, everybody, for having me. My name is Demelza Hayes, and I am the director of research at Cointelegraph, and I'm also the fund manager for the Zeltner & Co. Um, Bitcoin fund. So I just wanted to go ahead and uh, discuss something that's maybe more theoretical uh, in nature and then get some feedback from, from the audience and maybe what your thoughts are. So, okay, one topic that people ask all the time is when is Bitcoin going to be adopted finally? Like when can I use Bitcoin to pay for my coffees and, and my, my rent and everything? And a lot of time people compare Bitcoin to the fiat money supply. So like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with plan B, uh, you know, at 100 trillion on Twitter, right? So, you know, he's already thinking about Bitcoin compared to the global fiat monetary system. But there's a huge difference between Bitcoin and the global fiat monetary system. And that's that Bitcoin is the final settlement layer, right? It's like a reserve asset. It's a bearer asset. It's it's uh, like wholesale money equivalent in a bank. It's equivalent to a bank reserve. It's not equivalent to fiduciary media that is then you know, backed by bank reserves, right? Because it's, it is the final settlement layer. So if we were to think about like, you know, what is the real parallel to the, the current monetary system? We've got Bitcoin base layer, then we've got all the exchanges that have their fiduciary media claims, so right, Saba or Kraken or whomever's got the private key, and then they're issuing a claim to the user, you know, that's basically a claim on those Bitcoin. And now that's the fiduciary media in the system. And that's the same as when you have a bank that's got wholesale reserves at the central bank, and then they're issuing credit out against those bank reserves. So that's kind of the first premise, is that one, it's not 100 trillion, it's closer to like 27 trillion. And when we think about Bitcoin in terms of being base money, which is what it really is, Bitcoin's like number 10 in the whole world right now. It's right behind uh, the Swiss franc in the United Kingdom in terms of the size of the, the, the bank reserves in those countries. So it's actually not that far off from being bank, uh, you know, the, the actual final settlement layer in terms of, of size. So I'm going to answer three questions. I'm going to discuss what will it look like uh, if Bitcoin becomes base money. I'm going to discuss how much will one Bitcoin be worth? So this is a, 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 a kind of a little bit of a model maybe we can say, a very simple one. And then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give you the answer as to when Bitcoin will become base money. And uh, there's, this is not investment advice, so disclaimer. All right, so what's the whole background here? So, okay, a lot of the early Bitcoiners were very involved in Austrian economics. Um, a lot of Austrians, they say things essentially like fiduciary media is unethical. Like they actually argue that we shouldn't have any credit, right? And if you guys listen to Jeff Booth, so The Price of Tomorrow, like he's written a book recently on, on the debt nature of the fiat system and how fiat's based on theft and everything like that. Um, you have a lot of Bitcoiners who, they fundamentally disagree with the ability to issue claims against your Bitcoin. So if you're a Bitcoin bank, they don't want to have any claims running around in society that are fractional, which means you've got more claims out than you've got Bitcoin in the vault. Um, this goes back to Mises and human action. Okay, so Mises, you know, Ludwig von Mises, the first half of his life, he was actually in favor of fiduciary media. The second half of his life, he reversed that and he went towards the 100 reserve asset um, arguments. So if we just think about it from like a breakdown, we've got Larry White, Larry uh, uh, Seacrest, George Selgin on one side of the argument. So they're saying credit expansion is natural. We can have Bitcoin backed by a lot of different, in, um, we can have reserves of Bitcoin and then banks like Kraken or Coinbase or Bank of America or UBS, they're issuing credit claims that we then go spend uh, to buy a coffee, maybe with our credit card or with the Lightning Network, we're, we're issuing some credit. Um, they're saying that, that it's normal, it's what the market wants, because we don't want to spend the most, you know, valuable asset that was ever created since the history of time, right? Maybe we don't really want to spend that. Other side, credit expansion is evil, 
It's actually unethical, like, and you should go to jail. And these guys, actually, if you don't think this is real, okay, which maybe you're on one side or the other, but Pierre Rochard, who was called Bit Mr. Bitcoin of the Year, right? Pierre Rochard on Twitter, actually, through the Texas Blockchain Council, got it illegal in Texas last week to issue uh, any type of claim on fractional reserve Bitcoin. So Celsius, Nexo, uh, Crypto.com, any of these guys that had claims running around on a, you know, fractional reserves of Bitcoin, that's, that's, that practice is now illegal in Texas. Okay, so they are going towards 100% reserves. Now who's on that side? Caitlin Long. I'm a big fan of her. She wants to do custodia bank, narrow bank, narrow banking model. What's the problem with this? The problem is that you the depositor has to pay the fees. Right, because they're not lending, they're not, and they're not pooling, they're not pooling assets, they're not doing maturity transformation. So on this side, you've got 100% reserve, you're, you're paying a fee, or you might not pay a vault fee, but they're going to charge you a higher spread on your Bitcoin USD when you go to trade. Right, so they are, they got fees in there somehow. This side, uh, Matthew Mazinski's, he's Porkopolis, um, he's got great content on how Bitcoin could look. In, in a system with fiduciary media. And we actually already have a system where there's fiduciary media. So Kraken, Coinbase, Binance, that's all fiduciary media, but backed by a certain amount of Bitcoin. It could be 100%, right? But we don't have any way to really audit that, right? We don't know how many liabilities they have out and about versus, versus how, I mean, they can do a proof of reserves, but we still don't know the proof of liability side. You'd have to rely on an auditor statement or something like that, right? So if we just look at like the current, what does base money look like, right? We've got like, in this system, we've got close to 90% of bearer asset, real reserve. Then we've got like 10% of fiduciary media. Okay, so the argument of the free bankers is that in a free system, the people will naturally limit credit expansion because there's a hard asset behind the reserves that can't be printed out of thin air. And so if a company does start to print too much, they actually go bottoms up eventually because there's no lender of last resort that can print money like infinitely, right? So th this is kind of how it looks right now. And Lightning Network is a little bit in between. It's not really fiduciary media. It's not really the bearer asset. It's a little bit of, a, of an interesting area. Peter Todd and, and various developers have kind of tried to figure out, you know, what that looks like. I mean, right now we've got about 19 million or so out. We've got about 5,000. Bitcoin capacity for Lightning, and then as you can see, you know we've got a couple a couple million Bitcoin on uh, on exchanges. Okay, so now what does it look like in the current system? Okay, the yellow part, uh, the 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 bank reserves, the Fed repos, and the vault cash. So the yellow part, the first little bottom down here, that's bank reserves. The rest of our current system is fiduciary media. Right? It's all credit. It's all credit claims on a tiny little amount of bank reserves. Now, this is just for the United States, but every single economy looks just like this, and every single fiat currency. So, one thing to notice, you know, you can see, like, how much of the actual money in the economy is fiduciary media versus reserves. So it's about, the, it's about the exact opposite of Bitcoin, right? So fiduciary media in our current system is like 90%. We've got 10% bank reserves. In Bitcoin, it's the exact opposite. You've got 10% fiduciary media and 90% bearer asset underneath. Okay, so the next question is, how much will Bitcoin be when it becomes base money? Okay, so this is, if you add up all 50 uh, base monies in the world, uh, you get something around 29 trillion. Then you add up gold, you add up silver, base money, which historically, those were the base monies, his, you know, gold and silver, right? When you add all those up and you divide it by the, you know, amount of Bitcoin, you get about 1.4 million. Um, and, you know, the, the question is, is will banks or, you know, yeah, will central banks or, or banks ever really go to using Bitcoin as base money? And the point is that they won't until the volatility of Bitcoin versus fiat trading pairs like USD, Euro is lower than the volatility with other fiat trading pairs. So if we just look at this, we can see that Bitcoin's volatility has been coming down. Uh, the last five years or so, USD Euro um, volatility has been increasing slightly. So if we just forecast those, 
those growth rates out, right, we hit an inflection point in 2028, okay, when, when Bitcoin's volatility may become lower than the biggest fiat trading pairs, okay? And at that point, we could have hyper-Bitcoinization, okay? So right now, we don't imagine that this could ever happen, all right? But when enough, when the volatility gets low enough and the volatility of fiat is actually higher, it's actually going to make more sense for them to keep a certain amount of their reserves in Bitcoin. So if we look at this, uh, another interesting point about 2008, uh, 2028 is that that's the next halving. So we got one in 2024, right? Then we have one in 2028. So 2028 is going to be a super cycle, like because it's going to be the period at which volatility come, comes down a lot, plus we got another halving. Now, how do we bring about um, stability in the, in the unit of account? Basically, one big problem with gold, okay, being the money, is that it doesn't have an inelastic supply. Okay, so if you have a shock for demand, a high increase in demand, and gold's your only money and you have no credit, right, you're just in a system with full reserves, 100% reserves, then you, you, your, 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 your price of your reserve asset shoots up because there's a new demand and it's not an inelastic supply, right? It's an elastic supply. Sorry, sorry, it, it's not an elastic supply, it's inelastic because it's fixed. So when that happens, the currency and the prices are no longer a good source of information that matches suppliers with demanders. So let me give you an example. You're a farmer, everything's priced in Bitcoin. You see the price of milk go up. You don't know if that's because more people are demanding milk or because more people are demanding Bitcoin. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, okay, if it's because of milk, I'm gonna go buy more cows, I'm gonna get another warehouse, I'm gonna get more land. You, you invest capital in this process. Then it turns out it was because of just because of higher demand for Bitcoin, okay? And then you've misallocated capital, right? So that's why the unit of account, it's, it's a surrogate for information that matches supply and demand and makes the most efficient allocation of capital possible in the economy. So we, we absolutely need this. And the economies that have stable units of account will have better capital allocation. They won't have zombie companies and all these things because demand is not distorted, right? It's not distorted with the noise from the volatility of the measuring stick that we measure prices in. So long story short, the, the Zeltner & Co. Bitcoin uh, Stabilization Fund uh, we've raised about 30 million for it. Um, Thomas Zeltner is the son of Jörg Zeltner, who was the former president of UBS Wealth Management. Um, he's got his office in Zurich. Um, the idea is that we are going to be a buyer of last resort. So essentially, uh, on Kraken and on the top four exchanges, we're always going to be in the market ready to buy. And what that means is that we need a lot of capital, right? So based on the top four exchanges, uh, current price of Bitcoin, and the current volume on those four exchanges, we need right now currently $9 billion in order to stabilize Bitcoin's price is what we need. Um, so I know that sounds crazy, but the, so far we, we, have, we do think that we've been able to reduce some of the volatility and this is just gonna continue on as we grow the fund. Um, and so yeah, so we think that you know, basically essentially once Bitcoin stability comes down, it's going to be a period of hyper-Bitcoinization. That's, that's the thesis. All right, so almost finished here. Just a final couple questions. Um, Pierre Rochard's uh, proud that Texas has now outlawed fiduciary media on, on Bitcoin. Fractional reserves, I mean, these are super controversial topics, right? Because the Bitcoiners, for the, some of them, are very anti-fractional reserves, right? But I think that in order for us to supplant the current system, we can't go to a system that has no credit. But we can go to a system that has credit that is naturally limited by the free market, right? Because when you issue too much, your company is gonna go bankrupt because nobody will be able to bail you out, okay? So anyways, I'd love to get any feedback on this, uh, this, this uh, presentation and thesis. And yeah, I'm happy to to get your feedback, um, feel free to reach out to me, Demelza, uh, Crypto PhD on Twitter. And uh, yeah, cheers. Let's give it up for Demelza. We all wish we knew all that you know. 
because it's an incredible knowledge. Thank, Thank you. you.